There's a thing we call the 94% rule. And it's basically this. This was coined by Deming. He said that 94% of the outcomes we experience in the workplace, both good and poor, are a function of the systems and processes in which people work, not the efforts of people. Now think about that for a second. How many leaders and managers know that? Really? I mean, do you see it in, you know, the, the manuals telling you how to be a good leader or in the manuals telling you how to be a good manager? No, you just don't. And so what we see in most leadership and management is people leading and managing the 6%. They're trying to get people to behave differently to get a better outcome. But the people cannot, in most cases, do any better than the systems will allow them to do. Hello and welcome to Activating Greatness. I'm Nathan Crane, an award-winning author, documentary filmmaker, and health and wellness expert. And I'm Derek Crane, a certified personal trainer, health and fitness coach, and trainer of professional athletes. Each week, we broadcast new episodes with experts on life, health, fitness, business, and leadership to help you manifest the greatness that's already within you. Activating Greatness is about helping you live your life to your fullest potential and live with more meaning, purpose, health, and fulfillment. In this episode, we're talking with David Dibble about leadership, building a company from scratch to a multi-million dollar company, the new agreements for leaders, the most important things for small businesses and large businesses to focus on, and so much more. At the young age of 24, David started a company in a garage with only $5,000 and built it to a profitable $10 million in sales with 200 employees. David's an expert in workplace systems improvement, and since 1990, he's been training and consulting using his four new agreements for leaders and managers as a now proven model for sustainable organizational transformation with truly remarkable results. Over eight years, much of his new agreements work has been done in hospitals and healthcare systems, the outcomes of which border on unprecedented, which we'll talk more about in this podcast. He's written four books, including The New Agreements in the Workplace and The New Agreements in Healthcare, as well as his latest book, The New Agreements for Leaders. David studied for eight years with Don Miguel Ruiz, author of the best-selling book, The Four Agreements, you're probably aware of. If not, you should definitely listen to it uh, on audio or read it. It's a great book. David's also the winner of the prestigious T Award for Innovation in Executive Coaching and believes that new, more evolved systems thinking leaders in the workplace will become catalysts for raising human consciousness globally. David is a dear friend and colleague. I've known him for many years, and the work that he's doing is, is truly transformational when it comes to not only transforming yourself as a leader, but also your business, your organization, um, whatever it is that you're involved in. And before we dive into this incredible episode, we want to thank our sponsors for helping make this podcast possible for you. Performance tea is something both Derek and I drink and love. One thing we really like about it is that it's handcrafted in small batches and made of the best medicinal herbs. We're both huge believers and consumers of herbs and love the healing benefits that herbal medicine brings to the body. Go to performancetea.com and use the code ACTIVATE15 to get a 15% discount off your order. They have incredible teas for energy, focus, recovery, and balance. Again, that's performancetea.com and use the code ACTIVATE15 to get a 15% discount today. So if you're ready to activate your greatness and your deeper levels of leadership, then let's dive into this inspiring episode. Hey, David, thanks so much for being here with us. Well, I'm so excited to be here. It's uh, been a while since uh, we've seen each other, Nathan, and it's so great uh, to see you, Derek, and 
I think uh, we're going to have a great time and uh, hopefully we'll provide, uh, provide some real value for your listeners. Yeah, looking forward to it. So let's start talking about this company you started in your garage when you were 24. Can you talk about what was it? How'd you get it started? A little bit of backstory there. Well, I had just uh, gotten out of college and uh, was trying to figure out what I was going to do. And uh, I had a neighbor uh, who said to me, hey, you know, uh, if we had $5,000, we could start this business uh, and we could be millionaires within a year. And I thought, oh, well, that sounded pretty good. And so uh, we, of course, talked some more about this, but finally decided, all right, let's start this, uh, this business. And we went in the back of an old paint warehouse and uh, started nailing tables and chairs together. And of course, uh, this business, uh, we were manufacturing uh, printed circuit boards, which is a capital intensive business. And probably bare minimum, you'd need uh, about a quarter of a million dollars to even start something like this. So we were technically um, bankrupt from the moment we opened the doors, but uh, I wasn't very good at reading balance sheets and income statements. And so I thought we were still in business and we kept going. And so, so what happened next? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I had been a business major in college, and, uh, but knew nothing about business. And so we made every mistake you can possibly imagine, but we just kept sticking to it. We were working 12 hour days and seven days a week. And, um, you know, little by little, we started getting the hang of it. And um, at one point, uh, you know, we started to grow. And um, as, uh, as you mentioned, you know, over time, we built it into about a $10 million business. And uh, we were profitable. We had a couple hundred employees. And out of our roughly 2,000 competitors uh, nationwide, uh, we were probably in the top five, both technically and from a quality standpoint. And so we, uh, we actually become a, became a great little company. And um, I, was, I was often asked to speak uh, back in the day, you know, on uh, sort of this uh, incoming wave of, you know, quality and technology and, uh, and that sort of thing. And, um, I guess, I guess you'd say that we were somewhat successful. <laughs> I guess you would say that. Definitely. I would definitely say that. Um, now what was, um, uh, what was the, what was, what do you think was kind of the turning point for you that helped you get to a higher level of success? You said, you know, you didn't, you know, realize that you guys were technically bankrupt from the beginning. So you just kept going. I mean, obviously some, some sense of uh, naivety or even lack of knowledge of business may have helped you in some ways. Right. But, but really I think you probably had a, a big turning point at some point. Yeah. What, what was that or what sticks out in your mind? Well, I think there was a, a big turning point, and uh, it was back in the late uh, 1970s. Um, I read a book by a man called W. Edwards Deming, and uh, Deming is considered to be uh, probably the number one quality uh, and systems guru ever. Uh, he is credited with uh, turning Japan around after World War II. And I read his book, and it was my introduction to uh, systems-based management and to systems and the power of systems and process. And I started implementing uh, what I learned from Deming and, and other people that I studied uh, in my own business. And all of a sudden, uh, the business took off. And I started, you know, I became a bit of an expert in you know, systems and systems implementation and how to improve systems so we got better outcomes and better results. And of course, that has served me well um, in my consulting and training and uh, coaching business. Well, what would you say was the biggest challenge that it comes to mind in, in growing that business? What were some of the big challenges you were facing? I think there were probably uh, two. Um, one was lack of capital. Um, 
you know, when you have to figure out, you know, how you're going to buy paper clips and how you're going to make the payroll uh, a lot of the times, that's a really tough way to run a business. And uh, I mean, we worked our way through it and we were very innovative and, and that sort of thing, but uh, still a very difficult way to, uh, to run and grow a business. And the second thing was just um, management. Um, you know, people, particularly entrepreneurs, you know, uh, I don't think we think a lot about management um, as a skill set. But it is. It's, uh, it is a very profound skill set. And uh, particularly if you're going to take a systems-based approach uh, to management. And then on top of that, I would add leadership. Um, you know, the idea, I think the idea for a leader is to, number one, know where you're going uh, and have that be right. And then number two, set your people up to be successful in their jobs. Uh, and they, in turn, will set your customers up to be successful. So um, I think those are the two major things, of, you know, trying to uh, always do things with not enough uh, cash to be able to do it. And then secondarily, just not understanding the skill sets that you really need to be a really good manager and a really good leader. And what would you say was your best learning experience from that company? Um, I would say, I would say number one, uh, persistence. Mm -hmm. um, I really do believe that, you know, things are created inside out. You know, we get things that in our minds really, really clearly. And then we just, you know, there's this like stick to you know, where we see it, uh, we're really, you know, impelled, uh, you know, to, to kind of go for that dream, whatever it happens to be. And nothing's going to stop us no matter what. And so I think that, and, um, and then also this, uh, this thing around um, systems, because I, this is something I, I was planning on sharing with you a little bit later when we talk about the tools and this sort of thing. <clears throat> but there's a thing we call the 94% rule. And it's basically this. This was coined by Deming. He said that 94% of the outcomes we experience in the workplace, both Good and poor are a function of the systems and processes in which people work, not the efforts of people. Now think about that for a second. How many leaders and managers know that? Really? I mean, do you see it in, you know, the, the manuals telling you how to be a good leader or in the manuals telling you how to be a good manager? No, you just don't. And so what we see in most leadership and management is people leading and managing the 6%. They're trying to get people to behave differently to get a better outcome. But the people cannot, in most cases, do any better than the systems will allow them to do. And so you can see, here we are, you know, we've all been taught this myth uh, about, oh, well, you know, we need to do this with our people and do that with our, their, with our people. And, but you don't hear a word about systems. So I just got lucky, I think, you know, when I stumbled upon Deming. And, of course, that, that was a major breakthrough. It reminds me uh, when I used to live in San Diego. Um, this is probably six or seven years ago, I used to run along the beach and I'd listen to the Dale Carnegie courses, the leadership and management. And you talk about the different style of leaders. And, and it reminds me of one of the most, and I, I can't remember it word for word, but one of the types of leaders that he talked about was one who was, you know, the very passionate type, the one that showed up and got everybody going, the one that, you know, everybody depended on for their motivation. But, when that leader was gone, the companies would fall apart because they depended so much on him, right? Or her, whatever it might be. And how many companies have you seen um, in all of your work that, that are kind of based around maybe that type of leadership or less of a systems-based leadership? And what have you seen those results be? 
uh, almost all. You know, I've been at this now for 25 years, going out into all sorts of companies, large companies, small companies, all different industries. So what we see uh, out in um, the workplace, almost universally, is that uh, people are focusing on, managers and leaders are focusing on their people and they're focusing on numbers. And here's the thing, the systems are creating the numbers and the people are at the effect of the systems. So uh, it's really like trying to run the business by looking in the rear view mirror because we're looking at things that the systems have created and yet we're trying to get the people to change uh, something that they have no power to change. So it's, um, it's something that has become, I would say, uh, endemic. Um, in leaders and managers in all industries, um, large companies, small companies. It's, it's not that these people aren't smart and they don't know, you know, they're not doing their best and that sort of thing. It's just that they don't understand the power of uh, systems as far as creating really great businesses. So when you, you uh, went into the healthcare industry and you worked with this hospital and you did some remarkable things there. What were some of the, maybe you can share that story a little bit and share, you know, the challenges as well as the successes you had with systems. Well, this was, uh, this was actually very interesting. And uh, I got, um, so the, there was a person at this hospital that had read the four agreements and they had implemented the four agreements in their chemotherapy department. And they'd actually had some pretty good luck. You know, their patient outcomes had, had gone up and the uh, people working in the chemotherapy department, you know, their morale went up. And so they thought, oh, holy grail. Uh, now we're going to just take it out, you know, into the whole hospital. But of course, when they took it out in the whole hospital, it fell on its face. And so they wanted to, you know, they wanted help. How can we take uh, the four agreements into the, into the hospital? So I got a call. And uh, it was this guy, and he said, we saw that you had worked with uh, Don Miguel and that uh, you had, uh, you know, taken the four agreements into the workplace. We wondered if you could help us. And I said, yes, uh, I think I can, but you guys are going to have to do systems work because if you don't do the systems work in conjunction with the four agreements, the four agreements won't work. They won't stick. And so he said, okay, so we ended up on a conference call with the uh, CEO and members of the board and the executive team and so forth. And the CEO said to me, well, how much work have you done in hospitals? And I said, none. <laughs> and he said, well, how much do you know about healthcare? And I said, nothing really. Uh, I just know it's a mess. <laughs> he said, well, why would we want to hire you if you've never done anything in healthcare and you don't know anything about it? And I said, well, maybe because I've never done anything in it. I don't know anything about it. Um, but I'm also might ask, uh, how are all those other consultants you hired doing? And he said, this is uh, one of the worst sales pitches I've ever heard. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, uh, I said, look, John, I'm, I'm just kind of having a little fun with you. I said, look, systems are systems. It doesn't matter whether it's in healthcare or in the hot dog stand, or in IBM. It all works the same. And so I said, the problems you're facing uh, in your hospital are systems-based, and we can fix that. And so that's why you ought to hire me. And so anyway, they, they took a flyer and hired me. But one of the things that was really interesting about this whole thing was, um, whenever you consult uh, with a company, they always give you the worst stuff to work on. You know, they want to get their money's worth. And so they sent me down to work in this wellness center they owned. And uh, this wellness center had a 274 similar facilities nationwide. They were number 272 in patient satisfaction. I mean, it's remarkable to be dead last out of 272 or 74 similar uh, companies. But they were. It was just a snake pit and it had been lost money for eight straight years. It was a mess. 
So they sent me down to work with this, the director, his name was Brian. And uh, I walked in, Brian thought I was coming in to fire him. I said, no, we're not here to fire you. I said, I'm going to help you turn this thing around. And he said, oh, great. I said, but look, that's not the real opportunity for you. The real opportunity is if you want to, I'll train you in how to use these seven tools and you'll become a really great leader and manager. And one day, if you master these things, you'll be a great CEO. And he goes, what? I can't believe it. I thought you were going to fire me and now I'm going to be a CEO. I said, yep. So anyway, he was great. And so we turned the wellness center around and um, made it profitable. And it was really cool. He was a hero. And then I was leaving. I'd been there about 14 months. And we would put uh, a million two uh, additional profit on the bottom line for the hospital. Now, this wasn't a big outfit. It was only uh, it was $30 million in sales. And they were making about $2 million projected. And we put, I mean, $3.2 million. So I was a bit of a hero as well. Just, but, just by changing systems. I mean, this wasn't implementing some new big marketing strategy or going out and spending hundreds of thousands on new advertising. It was simply changing systems. And you saw over a million dollar increase to the bottom line. Yeah. And that's wow. not unusual. Normally, normally we'll see somewhere between uh, 3X to 10X, um, whatever the uh, implementation of the system's uh, change uh, costs are. So that includes, included me, it included what we had to do to change the systems, all that stuff. They still, you know, ended up making uh, about 5X um, on everything that they had spent to make these changes. So it's, it's the real deal. But here's the real story, and this is the one that I actually talk a little bit about in the book, uh, The New Agreements um, for Leaders. So I left and Brian asked me, what should I do? I said, well, go train your peers and you'll move up in the organization. And so he did and he became a VP. And then the CEO that I worked for left and they brought a new CEO and he did not like the idea that people down where the work was being done were solving problems, making decisions, um, because the new agreements for leaders is a bottom up strategy, not a top down strategy. So he was a control freak. He was really, you know, yeah, oh, man, I don't like the idea. These people are doing stuff without asking our permission and so forth and so on. So um, he undid everything that we had done. In fiscal 2013, this hospital on sales of 30 million lost $9 million. Jeez. It's, it's impossible. I mean, if you tried to screw a company up, you couldn't figure out a way to lose $9 million on sales of 30 million. So they fire the CEO and the four VPs he brought in. And the only one left standing was Brian. So Brian said, well, you said one day I'd be a CEO. <laughs> <laughs> they made him the interim CEO. He says, he told me the thing. He said, what should I do? I said, all right, Brian, stop the bleeding. That's number one. And then re-implement everything. And so he did. And in 11 months, he took the hospital from a $9 million loss to $1.1 million profit with no layoffs. Jeez. I don't believe it's ever been done in the history of American business, mm -hmm. not without layoffs. And all he did was implement the new agreements and the seven tools, re implemented them. So, you know, it's like we're on to something. Mm -hmm. So, the, this is outlined in your new book. Uh, you go deeper into it in the courses uh, on your website. People can take these courses and learn how to implement this. But let's, let's get into that in this podcast. Uh, in your book, The New Agreements for Leaders, you have the new agreements as well as the tools outlined. Can you start by going into what are these new agreements? Um, and talk a little bit about one by one. Okay. Uh, the first new agreement is to find your higher purpose for work. And I believe 
that we are all here for uh, some sort of a higher purpose. Um, I believe that our work also should be for some sort of a higher purpose. And here's the thing, if you can identify your higher purpose for work, it's like the universe will basically align with you to kind of move you toward that higher purpose. So um, I just think this, it's worthwhile you know, to spend a little time. Now finding your higher purpose is an inner journey. It's not something that uh, you're gonna go out and you know, dig around on the outside world and come up with it. But um, there's actually another little training that we do on, um, on the website. It's called Find Your Higher Purpose. And it basically takes you on an inner journey to see if you can identify your higher purpose. Uh, the second one is to grow and serve your people. And this is sort of servant leadership and some of the other things. I really believe this. I do not believe that you can lead if you don't care about people. And the other thing is that if you serve your people, you will serve the company and you will serve your customers. So this idea about growing your people, you grow your people, you're going to grow their talents, they will grow the business. Uh, so grow and serve your people. The third one is to lean into the core problems. And uh, this is basically doing the systems work. So you don't even know what your core problems are unless you know what your pro what's going on in your systems. So if we can teach people how to be more systems-based um, and to learn you know, how, to, how to use this particular agreement, become systems thinkers, um, basically this is the driver of everything else and it's the most important new agreement. You do just this one agreement, it will totally transform your business. And then finally is pursue mastery. And I think as a leader or manager, it's a mastery, you know? Um, and so the way you pursue that mastery is, in my opinion, is by looking to master uh, the new agreements. You master these new agreements, you'll master, you'll master leadership, you'll master management, and I believe you'll master life. So, so you talk about it in the book uh, about systems, and I first learned about the S curve and some of these systems theory from you actually years ago when we were when we were uh, working together in San Diego, and um, and it's changed my whole perspective on life and in business. And um, maybe you can talk a little bit about some of the systems theory that you've learned and, and that you apply, and why it's important that we come from that approach. Okay, Nathan, um, you know, you've, you've got me in a, in a real sweet spot here. <laughs> so I'd like to introduce uh, your listeners to a man named Ilya Prigogine. And Ilya Prigogine won a Nobel Prize in 1977 for his Law of Dissipative Structures. And the Law of Dissipative Structures describes how the universe, basically the universe is made up of systems and subsystems from the macro to the micro. And those systems all evolve based on the law of dissipative structures. And what that says is this, if you take a system, you'll always have a certain amount of energy coming into the system and a certain amount of energy that it dissipates. And when the incoming and the outgoing is in equilibrium, you have a stable system. But in a changing environment, what happens is a system that resists change requires more energy to stay the same. And so that stresses the system. You'll see actually systems start to vibrate when uh, they're stressed. And eventually the stresses become so great that the system flies apart into a state of chaos and then later reforms into a completely different system. It's not a bigger one of these. This is real important. It's completely different and it's not predictable. Or, or, or it goes away, right? It has to reform or it goes away? Well, no, it won't go away. I mean, the existing system may go away when it flies into chaos, but that energy has to go somewhere and it will, again, coalesce somewhere into uh, another system of some kind. 
And so the same thing happens in the workplace. And what we see in the workplace is systems that are under stress because they've resisted change, um, you'll see that those stresses are passed on to the people that have to work in those systems. Right. Now, the energy in those systems is normally physical energy, but when it's passed on to people, it's passed on as emotional energy, as stress. And so what we do with the, uh, with the seven tools is we reverse engineer the, the stresses on people back to the systems that are creating that stress. And now that tells us where we're going to get the biggest return on investment for doing systems work. And at the same time, relieving the stresses on the people. So now we're basically doing two kinds of work. We're doing transformation at the systems level, and we're also doing transformation at the level of people. So, so in a company, um, just so I'm clear, as, as kind of an example, um, let's say a company can handle currently with its current systems uh, 500 clients a month right? Things seem to be going smooth. It's okay. Um, not too many problems. They're profitable. And they implement some new big marketing campaign. And all of a sudden, they get that influx of energy. They get 700 clients a month or 1,000 clients a month. And what you're saying is, and what systems theory says is, if their systems aren't able to handle that capacity of new energy, new clients, new money, new problems, new everything, then that's basically, uh, once it reaches a certain point, it explodes into something new and either that company closes and goes away or they have to change their systems to keep up or they're going to be in just constant stress all the time. Yeah, exactly. What we know is that every system has an optimum throughput. And when you go beyond what a system optimum throughput is, um, a the people can kind of hold things together for a little while, but they get tired um, after a while. And if you keep stressing the system, what you'll find out is this is before things fly apart. You will find that you get less throughput and your costs go up. So now I had this happen to me. I mean, I had a, an opportunity to, bring in a huge amount of work when I had my company. I was excited because it was profitable work and boy, we were going to be, you know, put on a third shift and this is going to be the best thing since sliced bread. But our systems were not prepared for that influx of that work. And so now all of a sudden uh, we're finding that uh, number one, we used to be able to do X, the systems. Now we're, we can only do 80% of X. Mm. And not only that, our costs have gone up. So now what was once profitable is now losing money. And of course, it's stressing the heck out of, out of my people. And so we've got all the soft costs that are going on top of that, you know, the people issues and so forth. So you see this a lot, particularly with fast growing companies. Everybody wants more sales, more sales. They want more growth. But the smart thing to do, of course, is to have your systems gate your growth. Because that way, you're number one, you're going to keep your profitability up and you're going to get that benefit for the additional sales because you don't have, uh, you, your fixed costs will stay approximately the same. And secondly, you're not going to burn your people up. So, so some of those systems in a company might look like your customer service, how that's set up, your uh, delivery of your service or product, right? How that's set up. Um, automation, you look at automation. What are, what are a lot of those, you know, additional systems that you might see in a company that need to be addressed? Going into a business, um, you never know uh, where the stresses are going to be greatest. And so we have a way actually very quickly, it's one of the first tools we use, it's called disruptive discovery. And literally we can go into almost any size business. And within about, within about half an hour, we can get where the stresses are. And then we go to the second tool, it's called distillation. And we'll actually start to narrow those stresses down. And within a day or two, in almost any size company, we can know where we're going to get the biggest return. What are those systems that are most stressed? 
So as an example, um, I just, I just went into a little company. It's a, about a million dollar company. They had, uh, they had seen their sales. They got to about a million dollars and they were expanding. And then all of a sudden, you know, there were some changes in the market and they lost about uh, 40% of their business. And now they've gone into a loss position. So they're trying to figure out what to do, you know, to fix the company. So we came in, we started running the tools and we quickly identified uh, number one, they had big problems in their sales and marketing systems. And number two, they had uh, problems in operations. Their, their operations couldn't, they basically couldn't handle, uh, you know, the million dollar um, sales levels. And so we had, those were the two issues. So we basically started running the tools and so forth and so on. And within uh, four months, uh, we had the company, we basically had taken them to a run rate, a yearly run rate, uh, to about uh, two and a half times the level when we started. And we had also added about 100% uh, additional capability to their operation side of the business. Now the systems were in place, they could actually grow, actually beyond the million dollar mark, and still remain profitable. And, you know, all this in about four months. So this is, this is pretty cool. That's huge. Yeah. So that's, so basically it's scalable. These systems are, once you start modifying them, then it's, is there a, a limit? And then you have to go in and change the systems again and change them again and change them again. Or how does that work? Yeah, it's an ongoing process. That's why I'm saying it's really a leadership and management model mm. because look, the environment that we're, we're working in and that we're living in is changing faster and faster. Uh, Buckminster Fuller called it accelerating acceleration as it relates to change. And so something that works today, you, I'll guarantee you, is not going to work tomorrow. Mm -hmm. It's just a matter of, you know, what's the lag period going to be and how much is it not going to work um, as well. So, yeah, it's an ongoing thing. It's not a program. It's something that you do on a regular basis. And if you, you stay with it and you do it on a regular basis, then you're always ahead of the curve. Mm -hmm. So I manage a local gym here at Anytime Fitness. And with the new agreements, would you say that there's one that's more important than any of the others? Uh, yeah, um, without a doubt, it's uh, lean into the, into the core problems mm -hmm. because um, that is going, if you just do that, let's talk about your gym for a second. Um, right now, whatever's going on in the gym, mm. um, the vast majority of those outcomes is going to be a function of your existing systems. Whether or not they're visible, the, that's what's going on. And so if you wanted, let's say, to take your gym, let's say you wanted to grow. Um, then what you would do is you would go in and you'd first find out what's the current condition mm. of your systems. And then of course you also take a look at your people while you're, while you're doing this. But now we know the current condition and then we'd look at say, well, where are you going to get the biggest return on the existing systems? And so now we run a thing called 80, 20. You'll find that generally 20% of the systems are producing 80% of the outcomes. And so we'll look at that and say, all right, we can't fix everything. So let's fix the important stuff. Mm -hmm. And so let's just say, you know, I'm making this up now, but let's say that uh, you need, you, your sales and marketing, you needed to bring more people uh, to the gym. That was one thing. And let's say your second thing was you needed more really good qualified trainers. Mm -hmm. I'm making it up, but having done a little work in gyms, that seemed to be the two things that popped up. Um, we would look at, okay, how do we bring more clients? We got to change the system, right? Because whatever you got right now, that's a result of whatever you're doing now. Hmm. Um, and then on your trainer side, whatever you've got now is a function of what you're doing now. So we would look to upgrade those two things and voila, my guess would be, we would see your growth rate accelerate and we would see your uh, customer satisfaction go up.
Mm-hmm. That definitely makes sense. And you're right on point too. <laughs> Thank you for giving the whole entire blueprint. <laughs> I'm a little bit of a smart man. <laughs> I did a little work oh. um, in uh, you know health and fitness. So uh, anyway, I, I like to look smart, so I just you know pretended like I knew what I was doing. <laughs> <laughs> and then and then let's say let's say someone is just starting out, like they're they're doing a startup. Like what would what would you suggest be the most important aspect to focus on as far as within a startup company? In my experience, uh, startups are far and away the most difficult to work with, uh, with systems. And the reason for that is, uh, and I know this cause I was the same way. Um, everybody is running around like chickens with their heads cut off mm-hmm. and you know, it's, it's almost like you're going to overcome all obstacles by, you know, working, you know, ungodly number of hours and just energy. You're just going to plow your way through. And so the two things that are normally missing, you know, for startups are, number one, uh, the time, even to get their attention to look at the systems is really, really hard. And then the second thing is, um, most of them have no time to want to learn how to manage. You know, it's interesting. Most startups, um, they don't fail because, you know, they didn't have a good idea or the product, uh, you know, uh, the technology was no good. Or they fail because of leadership and management. People don't have a clue, you know, what they're doing. And they're just trying to, you know, order stuff, you know, to get done or, energize, you know, have everybody, you know, come in on the weekends, you know, that sort of thing. Um, I've often thought that if we could get the new agreements to uh, venture capitalists, we'd probably have a huge market to, you know, make it part of what you do when you fund these things is, you know, train the people how to manage. So that would be the key right there is focus on your management skills and implement your systems up front before you do anything else. Yeah, because um, you're only going to get what the systems will deliver. And here's the thing, even if you're successful, let's say as a startup, okay, wow, you hit it. And now you've got all these orders coming in and you've got more money coming in and you know, all of that sort of thing. You know, we always hear about growing, growing gone, right? Well, What happens that causes, you know, a company that's doing so well when they hit a certain level on the sales side to just die? The answer is they've gone beyond their systems that worked at a certain level. Now they're at 2x, they don't work, their costs have gone to the moon, and, you know, the, the, the throughput has dropped off. And, of course, that's a recipe for disaster in a company. And so again, it's systems based, but it's invisible to people who don't, that don't know about systems. It, it uh, reminds me of my favorite restaurant here in Santa Fe. Um, I won't give the name out, but <laughs> every time I go there, uh, there's, there's one or two new employees. And then I go there another two or three weeks later, And the happy faces that they had three weeks prior are now this kind of grim, upset, (laughs) angry. And then about two weeks later, they're not working there anymore. And I'm not kidding. This has been going on for the four years that we've lived in Santa Fe. So clearly, that stress of whatever their system problems are is being passed down onto the employees. Otherwise, why else would you have such a high burnout rate? Yeah, and here's the interesting thing. Um, Restaurants are really fun uh, to work with because, uh, number one, um, the symptoms of poor systems are so visible. Mm. Actually, in uh, our trainings, a lot of times when we send the group out for lunch, we give them a worksheet and say, okay, look at all of the things that don't work or that could be improved. And they would come back, and I mean, God, the, we would basically run the tools. I'd say, all right, let's put down all of the issues. We'd run discovery on this particular restaurant. And the a whole list and this sort of thing, and then we'd run a distillation, and we would basically come down, and without these people in this restaurant even knowing it, we had identified 
the critical 20% of their systems that uh, needed to be fixed in order to, number one, reduce their costs, uh, improve their service, uh, improve their food, um, improve the business. And so, um, yeah, matter of fact, I'm working right now with a really incredible um, a company that serves really healthy food and uh, that sort of thing that wants to franchise. And so the first thing I said is, look, if you want to franchise, this has to become systems-based because you want to pick the system up and move it to another area where you basically get the same results with different people. Right. Because that's what a franchise is. So your systems have to be really tight. Yeah. Otherwise, you'll move it and it'll fall apart. So, um, yeah, we're actually looking at uh, creating now uh, basically a model for franchising almost anything. There you go. That's interesting. <laughs> that, that's, it's so interesting. Yeah, I've been, I've been doing uh, work with the Chi Center here in Santa Fe with Master Ming Tong, who's a, a teacher of uh, um, uh, wisdom healing Qigong. And the Chi Center is a retreat center. Um, and they've just, I mean, been growing incredibly, helping so many people. Come, people come in and completely transform their health and their life um, by practicing Qigong. And and have been a part, blessed to be a part of of the growth and marketing and and consulting, and now helping uh, connect with more health professionals and transformational leaders. And one of the kind of bigger vision down the road is not not necessarily a franchise, but a similar model that uh, we're discussing implementing so um it's just uh very synchronistic timing that we're talking and doing this podcast because um, <laughs> and, and it reminded me of of you and the work that you do because of how important it is that your systems are so dialed in if you're going to have anybody else starting to uh, offer or share what you're doing so they start doing their own thing how can you expect any kind of you know uh, relatable or, or measurable results. Um, mm -hmm. So it's, that, that's awesome. And so would you recommend, uh, I mean, it sounds like I would, I would guess uh, large organizations as well do the same thing, right? As, as a startup. I mean, it all really comes down to finding where your problem systems are and then fixing them. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Large companies or larger companies, um, I find I don't like working with them that much. And the reason I don't like working with them is that most of them, now not all, but most of them are so stuck. They have created, you know, these top-down hierarchical models. And, you know, a lot of times there's politics, a lot of fear. Um, they're trying to order, you know, things to be done. Everybody's afraid, you know, not everybody, but, you know, people are afraid of change. And so they're, um, as I said, not all, but boy, particularly older companies, they're, uh, they're dinosaurs, you know, they're basically, uh, you know, they're, they're evolving out of existence, particularly if they have to compete against a systems-based company. Because here's the thing, a system-based company produces higher quality products and services faster for less cost. Now, I don't know how long, you know, you can compete against something like that, but it's not forever. You know, in my opinion right now, General Motors is going out of business. Now, they made $4 billion or $6 billion last year, but they're going out of business because they are having to compete against companies that have a systems-based management who are producing higher quality products and services faster for less cost. And so it may take 50 years, I don't know, but uh, they'll be just like, you know, Chrysler and, you know, Ford eventually too. I mean, you know, you can't compete against companies that are better led and managed. So let's say somebody um, wants to work with you, wants to implement these new agreements, learn the tools. Um, what is their, what's their best next step? Go to the website, get the book, right? 
So your website, thenewagreements.com. I know there's a couple options there for the book, The New Agreements for Leaders. They can get the free ebook. They sign up for your newsletter or they can buy the book. Um, and it's a great quick read that gives you more in depth on, on uh, the agreements and the tools. But what is really um, the next step for people? Well, I think, I think you're right, uh, Nathan. The first step um, I really think is to read the book. You're either going to resonate with uh, what is in that book in some way, or you won't. And uh, so I, I use the book as kind of a, a filter for people that are sort of ready for, you know, this sort of a transformational process at a business level. And then um, the second thing I would say is, if there is really something that resonates, you think, gosh, I'd really like to learn more about this and that sort of thing. Uh, take the New Agreements for Leaders course, the online course. It's a really good course, and it will get you to the point where you can begin to practice the use of the seven tools. And here's the thing, how do you master something? Through practice. Mm -hmm. And here's the thing, if you master the seven tools, you will master leadership, you will master management, and you could even go one step further. I'm now working, I've, I've had a train the trainer program uh, for live audiences, uh, but now I'm gonna take it online for there'll be an online train the trainer program. And this will be for people who um, want to teach this, uh, people who want to work with me uh, directly and that sort of thing. But I envision at some point, there's going to be thousands of people around the world teaching this. Um, and they're going to make the world a better place. They're going to make, you know, the businesses better. Uh, they're going to make themselves better. So I, uh, I have high hopes and, you know, my normally highly optimistic vision. <laughs> you and me both i can see it happening and you know my question is if you have a product or service that is changing the world that's helping people improve their life that's increasing the quality of somebody's health that's you know can make a positive impact in someone's life or on the planet then why wouldn't you want to cultivate and develop these abilities to the highest level so you can be the most successful with it. So, um, you know, that's the question we all need to ask ourselves. And I know we are through Crane Factor, we're, we're, we're talking about, you know, implementing and, and improving our own systems as, as we start to grow. And um, I love your work, David. I, I, you know, love you as a friend and as a colleague and consider you family. And, you know, we've known each other for quite a while and uh, just appreciate you and the, the work you do and I think it's incredible and I'd love to see thousands of certified uh, instructors teaching this uh, to the world we need it for sure uh, well I also want to say uh, I so appreciate you guys as well um, I love your work um, you're making a real difference in the world and look if there's anything that I can do you know a phone call away uh, just, you know, give me a call and I'm happy to share with you anything I can that would be helpful. Thank you so much, David. And everybody tuning in, uh, in the show notes, you'll find the links and, and the details to David's website. Again, it's the new agreements with an S.com. Pick up his book, join his newsletter, uh, join uh, the course and start implementing um, this important conscious systems work into your business today. Thank you. Thank you. That's it for today's episode. Our hope and desire is that you get as much out of these interviews and episodes as we do. Each week, you can count on us being here to help you activate the greatness that's already within you. And we can all do that by continuing to develop and grow our minds, bodies, emotions, and connection to a higher purpose. Please make sure to share this with your friends on Facebook, iTunes, Twitter, and Instagram. Tag Crane Factor and use the hashtag activating greatness so we can continue growing this community together and changing the world for the better. And a huge shout out to our sponsors for making this show possible. Head over to performancetea.com to try their recovery, balance, focused, and energy teas. These teas are made from incredible healing herbal plants that help your body heal, gives you natural energy, helps prevent disease, and help you feel better in every way. 
Again, that's performance T, that's T E A, performance T.com, and use the code activate15 to get a 15% discount off your order. That code works on their website and it also works on Amazon. Again, activate 15, and you'll get a 15% discount off of these amazing teas. We appreciate you tuning in and for supporting our sponsors who make this show possible. Remember, you already have greatness within you. You just need to activate it. Thanks again, and we'll talk to you on the next episode.